Okay, so uh, welcome to uh, Patrick's students in Mainz. This is your lecture on the ballad from ELC 124 Poetic Forms. Um, I'm Dr. Catherine Charlwood and I can be found on Twitter and if you have any questions for me I'd be very happy to hear them uh, if you just send them to the email address below. I normally uh, look a bit like this, <laughs> but that was when we were still allowed, allowed outside. Uh, so that's me in Wales. Um, I've elected not to do this lecture uh, as a video style because I think given lockdown conditions that wouldn't be appreciated by anyone. But uh, yes, I'm very happy to, to be with you, uh, although virtually. And I'm going to start the way I've started all of my teaching at Mites, which is to apologise for Brexit. Um, I am feel deeply conflicted about this. Um, I'm incredibly sorry. And yes, it makes it even more of a privilege to speak with you. And long may such intellectual collaborations flout petty politics. Right. So to give you an overview of what's coming up in this lecture, I've split it into three sections. First, I'll attempt to define a loose, and it has to be loose, perimeter around the word ballad. Then I'll look in depth at the forms which ballads take, using a couple of close readings of Wordsworth and Hardy poems, before turning to the possibilities within and beyond that structure. Throughout, I'm interested in using ballads as one way of considering the large and vexed question of poetic form in general, and I hope that this chimes with the sorts of questions you've already been thinking about in this course. As you'll see, by thinking about the questions which ballad form poses, uh, we end up in the territory of what constitutes poetry and the turn of the century break that comes when many poets abandon rhyme and metre, or at least appear to, in favour of free verse. Such a simple question, but with a complex answer. What do we mean by ballad? It's a simple word. It's a concept which has asserted itself in most every culture since time immemorial, but it's harder than you think to pin down. That said, Mark Strand and Evan Boland give it a good go in their anthology of poetic forms. They designate five statements to define ballads broadly. It is a short narrative, which is usually, but not always, arranged in four line stanzas with a distinctive and memorable metre. The usual ballad metre is a first and third line with four stresses, iambic tetrameter, and then a second and fourth line with three stresses, iambic trimeter. The rhyme scheme is ABAB or ABCB. The subject matter is distinctive, almost always communal stories of lost love, supernatural happenings or recent events. The ballad maker uses popular and local speech and dialogue, often and vividly, to convey the story. This is especially a feature of early ballads. So far, so good, right? But I want to problematise this definition. Before I do so, however, I want to focus your attention on certain aspects of Strand and Boland's definition. And I should point out that this is the first um, extract on your handout. We've got some kind of narrative impulse driving ballad. We can, at most, agree on what is usually, but not always, the case. Ballads are memorable. I'll return to this, but it's worth keeping this in mind when you think about mnemonic devices in epic poetry as part of this course. Ballads feature rhyme and metre strongly. In that sense, they are what is, um, uh, sorry, they are among what is commonly or traditionally thought of as poetry. Communal stories. Ballads are a format shared by multiple generations for sharing content with each other. While novelty might be prized in artistic creation, ballad form stems from the familiar and the recognisable. In their attention to local speech and dialogue, ballads reveal something about regional identity and a sense of place, and also might have a lower register and sound more colloquial than other forms of poetry. Finally, we're back to story. A ballad may spin as a yarn, but that's not to say that the story will necessarily be linear, complete, or lacking in enigma. If we look at the etymology of the word ballad, we can see that music and dance are strongly implicated in its meaning. Ballads were originally sung aloud and weren't written down. Ballads owe their origins to pre-literate oral culture. <laughs> 
Sure enough, the Oxford English Dictionary's first definition pertains to song. If we add in definitions 1b and 1c, a sense of ballads builds up as something popular and, in the case of 1b, perhaps satirical. Now, in order to understand how ballads used to operate, you need to imagine that you live in a pre-technological, pre-literate society. As Alan Bold puts it, the modern reader has lived so long with ballads as a permanent feature of every library that it requires an imaginative leap to conceive of a time when the ballads had no fixed texts and were simply and fondly remembered by those who enjoyed singing them. Critics have constructed such a massive academic apparatus around these beautiful songs that there are times when the direct power of the ballads is obscured, when topics like modality and music morphology are being debated, it is salutary to remember that many of the songs under critical scrutiny were sung not by sophisticated musical performers, but by milkmaids and nurses and ploughmen. Up until the end of the 19th century, ballads were still a popular and ubiquitous form of street entertainment. Popular ballads is the term designed, sorry, is the term designated to those ballads sung live, which were handed on without any recourse to text. You heard the ballad singer's performance and then you sought to replicate it. Popular ballads then could hang around in a largely stable form for generations without being written down. A much more, sorry, so, so this is a kind of uh, an example of a popular ballad uh, sample stanza. There lived a wife at Usher's well and a wealthy wife was she. She had three stout and stalwart sons and sent them o'er the sea. So you can hear that kind of strong driving rhythm um, and why that would kind of remain in, in a stable form despite not being written down until it was collected by child. So you've kind of got to imagine yourself on a street in 19th century London, because now we're going to think about a much more ephemeral form, the broadside ballad. So you're on a street in 19th century London. It's crowded, it's noisy, and everywhere there are sellers and street hawkers vying for your attention. The 19th century also sees the rise of advertising and a boom in patent medicines, these kind of individual preparations which made various spurious claims to being a miracle cure. So it's against that backdrop that I want to give you an example of one of these uh, broadside ballads. And this one pokes fun um, at such a medicine. So just briefly to look at this slide, then the broadside ballads, these are printed on a single sided sheet of paper. They, they last for really quite a long time, a good few centuries, and they're very cheap. So the, this is something that an awful lot of people have access to. And they're sold at markets, they're sold at race days, they're sold at fairs. So this is very much kind of something that's being passed around among many hands. And you can explore um, an awful lot of broadside ballads freely online from the Bodleian Library. It's a very excellent website. Okay, so we're on our 19th century street. We're aware that medicines are being well, medicine in inverted commas, you shouldn't and wouldn't actually take these, um, are being advertised everywhere. And one way to do this was to sing a ballad about them. So this is a satirical one, which unfortunately for you, I am going to try and sing. Come high and low and rich and poor and listen with attention To please you all, both great and small, a story I will mention If you forever wish to live, to banish every ill, sir Ten times a day you just gobble down A box of Marson's pills, sir they will the cholera more obscure, and that is very feasible. They'll cure a dog with a broken nose or a pig that's got the measles. They will a drunken husband cure, so keep him on low diet. They'll cure a woman's scalding tongue and soon make her be quiet. Okay, hopefully that gave you some idea and hopefully uh, Dr. Gill isn't in too much pain from cringing. Broadside ballads 
although printed, were much more ephemeral than popular ballads. They often responded to, or poked fun at, contemporary situations which had a very brief cultural half-life. So formally, they are very similar to the larger ballad tradition, but their content sits slightly at odds. A quick way to take down your professional rival in the 19th century was to pen and print a ballad attacking him. And in the 19th century, your professional opponent probably was male. Due to their popularity and lowbrow status, uh, scholars have traditionally seen broadsides as lesser than popular ballads. So when ballad collectors went around their respective countries preserving ballads in text for posterity, they tend to be collecting those ballads which have never previously been committed to paper. And because of this, ballad collectors needed to record several variants. So a couple of slides ago, we were looking at the, the Wife of Usher's Well, and that is one of these ballads that was collected by Francis James Child. So these were, were men who were very conscious that there was this oral culture, there were all of these unwritten poems that were circulating solely on the voice, and they wanted to make sure that these were collected and written down, so they didn't just kind of pass out of, of memory and, and therefore existence. Um, so some really dedicated work that goes on by people like Percy Grundtvig and Child uh, collecting ballads and their variants. And that's why um, in the previous slide, if I just go back to it, um, you can see that this is 79A in Child's collection. So they're also preserving variants. Um, if there's enough people singing one version of a song, but then, you know, it's possibly... Uh, you move over a couple of towns and maybe the general structure is the same, but there's a, a curious difference that they also collect. So just to point out briefly the breadth of creations um, encompassed by this one term ballad, I'd quickly point out Polish composer Frederick Chopin's ballad um, for piano. And really, I'm looking just for an excuse to, <laughs> to play this to... to um, Anyone and everyone thinks gorgeous. Um, so this is actually number three in A flat major. It's said to be inspired by the poetry of Herwitz, who was very much seen as one of the great ballads um, in, in Poland. So and what's interesting is that there is this musical form of ABCBA, um, but also Chopin's kind of created ballad form actually changes sonata form. And it goes on to inspire the art from list rocks. Sorry, that was a terrible place to stop it. Um, but yes, so just to make things confusing, there is another spelling of ballad as ballad. Now, this is related in many ways to the broader definitions of ballad with which we began, but it actually refers to a more tightly constructed poem, and it's more common to French than English because it relies on having a multiplicity of rhyme words which English doesn't readily provide. So here's a modern day example from contemporary poet uh, Wendy Cope doing what she does best, making fun of poetry while producing poetry. Uh, one stanza of this is on your handout. Fine words won't turn the icing pink. A wild rose has no employees. Who boils his socks will make them shrink. Who catches cold is sure to sneeze. Who has two legs must wash two knees. Who breaks the egg will find the yolk. Who locks his door will need his keys. So say I, and so say the folk. You can't shave with a tiddlywink, nor make red wine from garden peas, nor show a blind worm how to think, sorry, how to blink, nor teach an old raccoon Chinese. The juiciest orange feels the squeeze. Who spends his portion will be broke. Who has no milk can make no cheese. So say I, and so say the folk. He makes no blot who has no ink, nor gathers honey who keeps no bees. The ship that does not float will sink. Who'd travel far must cross the seas. Lone wolves are seldom seen in threes. A conquer ne'er becomes an oak. Rome wasn't built by chimpanzees. So say I, and so say the folk. Dear friends, if adages like these should seem banal or just a joke, 
Remember, fish don't grow on trees. So say I, and so say the folk. So Cope structures her poem out of a series of ludicrous, proverbial sounding statements. The final line of each stanza, the refrain, links to the idea of a ballad's communal nature. This is rehearsing folk wisdom, and thus is not to be questioned. Part of the comedy is that while these statements are patently ridiculous, they are also demonstrably true. Who has two legs must wash two knees, but it's so obvious as to be banal. Cope reroutes existing proverbs into rhymed lines which will meet the demands of the ballad form. So, you can't teach an old dog new tricks becomes nor teach an old raccoon Chinese, and Rome wasn't built in a day becomes Rome wasn't built by chimpanzees. Okay, so let's recap what we've seen so far. We've got sung ballads, we've got popular ballads. Um, both of these are ones which are, are, were not traditionally written down, they were only written down by collectors. Broadside ballads tend to be distinguished from popular ballads because they because broadside ballads um, were more ephemeral, they were more responsive to current events, and they were printed. We've also got musical ballad uh, from the Romantic era in music, and we've got the ballad as a specific poetic form, um, sort of longer and, and denser in rhyme, generally, than the ones we're speaking of. Now, I've also put up here um, the photo of Ray Charles's Ballad in Blue because the link between ballad and musical form is one that lasts right through to today's popular music. You will still see artists releasing um, ballads and singing ballads. So that link between the form and music uh, is incredibly resonant. So I've suitably exploded the meaning of the word ballad and left you more confused than where you started, right? That's why in this section, I'm gonna rein it in to what is most commonly thought of in terms of poetic ballads. And in your degrees, you're more likely to stick with poetic ballads rather than popular or broadside ballads, which tend to be studied as a historical or socio-cultural phenomenon rather than a literary one. Not that I'm saying I necessarily agree with that. So the obvious touchstone for poetic ballads is that touchstone in the history of poetry altogether, the publication of Wordsworth and Coleridge's Lyrical Ballads in 1798 and the second volume in 1800 with the famed preface. Now, while this is taken as poetry with a capital P, one of the reasons I spoke about popular ballads in the first section is because there's a false dichotomy between popular ballads and poetic or kind of literary ballads. Wordsworth and Coleridge were heavily influenced and inspired by Percy's ballad collection, excuse me, relics of ancient English poetry. Given that Wordsworth famously asserted that the lyrical ballads constituted fitting to metrical arrangement, a selection of the real language of men in a state of vivid sensation, we might see this work as a meeting point between the two types of ballad tradition, which criticism has always tried to separate. Fitting to metrical arrangement announces the question of poetic form and whether in versifying words, that is, in setting them within verses, poets are doing something unnatural to language. That is certainly what the free versifiers, those poets at the turn of the 20th century who abandoned rhyme and metre, would argue, with Ezra Pound noting, form, I think there is a fluid as well as a solid content that some poems may have form as a tree has form, some as water poured into a vase, that most symmetrical forms have certain uses, that a vast number of subjects cannot be precisely and therefore not properly rendered in symmetrical forms. I like this statement as it's one of the few moments when Pound admits, albeit grudgingly, that symmetrical forms have certain uses. Now I mentioned free verse partly to remind you of that to which ballads stand in stark contrast, but also because sung ballads or street ballads die out around the turn of the century and the rise of free verse coincides in some ways, understandably, with the demise of ballads. 
a form which is particularly informed by rhyme and metre. Certainly, words with phrasing fitting to metrical arrangement makes it sound as if he's forcing words to fit into a framework. And at its worst, that is exactly what ballads sound like. The, t the content exists purely to suit the container. I remember being an undergraduate and my supervisor for romantic poetry really rated Wordsworth, but he just couldn't forgive him for one rhyming couplet from The Thorn. This thorn you on your left espy, and to the left, three yards beyond, you'll see a little muddy pond of water never dry. I've measured it from side to side, tis three feet long and two feet wide. It's a real clangour, and it's always trotted out when journalists are looking for examples of the worst poetry in existence. It's also one of the worst double puns, since a verse is also a measure and has poetic feet instead of feet as a unit of physical measurement. Right, that was too easy a target, and I'm here neither to denigrate words with or ballads. The problem with those lines in The Thorn, for me, is that they're too predictable. Side awakens wide long before we get to it. The monosyllabic last line drums out the metre we're all expecting. But this is also exactly what gives ballads their power, the expectation of a particular beat. Here are the first four stanzas from a much better Wordsworth ballad, The Tables Turned. Up, up, my friend, and clear your looks. Why all this toil and trouble? Up, up, my friend, and quit your books, or surely you'll grow double. The sun above the mountain's head, a freshening lustre mellow through all the long green fields has spread his first sweet evening yellow. Books, tis a dull and endless strife. Come, hear the woodland linnet. How sweet his music. On my life, there's more of wisdom in it. And hark, how blithe the throstle sings. He too is no mean preacher. Come forth into the light of things. Let nature be your teacher. This poem is essentially the 18th century equivalent of when your friend wants you to stop studying and, and kind of come on a bike ride or something today. The Tables Turned, a response to its partner ballad where the opposite argument, stop wandering around the woodland and do some serious study, is advanced. This example allows you to, to hear clearly ballad meter at work. So what do we mean by ballad meter? Well, it's a meter that's so often used, it also goes by common meter and is used in a wide range of poems and songs from ancient hymns to Madonna's Material Girl, which I'm sure you'll all be thankful I'm not going to sing. We have four lines alternating iambic tetrameter and ambic, iambic trimeter, built on the iamb, a poetic foot consisting of an unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable. The basic underlying pattern then is dum di 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 dum An example of a very regular line would be the first line of the last stanza. And hark, how blithe the throstle sings. While we usually describe poems in terms of feet, ballad metre is also often known by the shorthand 8686, counting the number of beats per line. Even within this tight structure, though, Wordsworth allows the individual poem, rather than the form, to determine the sound. The metre aside, what stands out for me in this last line is the marrying of nature and teacher, a tenet of romantic ideals, through the use of the same rhythmic unit, stressed-unstressed, placed similarly within the iambic line. So nature kind of becomes the teacher and it's um, preempted by this rhythmic unit. OK, so now let's look at another example of a ballad from about a hundred years later from a poem, sorry, poet uh, who was heavily influenced by Wordsworth. English novelist and poet Thomas Hardy. And I think we can all agree they are both uh, tremendous lookers. Um, 
Okay, so this is in time of the breaking of nations. Only a man harrowing clods in a slow, silent walk, with an old horse that stumbles and nods, half asleep as they stalk. Only thin smoke without flame from the heaps of couch grass. Yet this will go on with the same, though dynasties pass. Yonder, a maid and her white come whispering by. War's annals will cloud into night ere their story die. Written in 1915, published in 1916, this sees the ballad form used to comment on war. While we can read this as a product of its specific contemporary context, the First World War, there's little in the poem that dates it beyond being, you know, kind of pre-mechanised farming. While the ballad form, well, sorry, while the same ballad form underlies the poem and the language is relatively simple, if slightly archaic sounding for 1916, it's not a simple, easily dismissed poem. That war is harrowing has become somewhat of a commonplace, but here it is only the meaning of harrowing as ploughing. Only is a spectacular word on which to begin a poem about the breaking of nations. And that, by the way, is a quotation from the King's James Bible, chapter 50, verse 21 of the book of Jeremiah. Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war, for with thee will I break in pieces the nations, and with thee will I destroy kingdoms. So a poet who had very famously lost his faith and become an atheist entitles the, his poem with a biblical quotation, thus setting up a kind of higher register, then to open it on only, bringing the reader back to a homely, everyday, workaday scene of one man ploughing. Only also challenges the reader to shirk their imagined ver version of what the breaking of nations might constitute to avoid what other kinds of fires might be burning. And while the poem fits within the frame of ballad metre, it doesn't have regular line lengths. The structure of the metre is 8696, 7685, 7585. The first stanza is the most regular, but from there Hardy lapses increasingly into cataleptic lines, ones with a final beat missing which fail to reach their full potential. While the poem ultimately ends on the positive idea that love will continue, that life will go on, the form suggests a backdrop of loss which resonates beyond and around these quiet, perhaps complacent figures. Now, as well as writing his own ballads, Hardy was known to be particularly interested in balladry. Edmund Goss inquired about, let's go a shooting, said Richard to Robin. And following a question about this ballad, which he'd used in his novel, Under the Greenwood Tree, Hardy replied, I have been unable to meet with a person who remembers the song about which you inquire, though some old people still sing it in this country. The song, as sung in this neighbourhood, has always been, as far as I know, orally transmitted only. Hardy's experience of ballads, then, is worldly as well as literary. These are songs he has heard firsthand. In this letter, as in several others, there is a sense of ballads passing out of existence as their singers die off. That they are orally transmitted only gives ballads an immediacy and vibrancy, but it also makes them susceptible to loss. In October 1924, Hardy showed his second wife the old barn at the back of Kingston Moorwood. Here, as a small boy, he had listened to village girls singing old ballads. Memory is evidently implicated in writing ballads for Hardy, in passing on textually those traditions he had received orally. That's sorry, that's A-U-R, um, spelling of orally. While I stress the role that ballads played in Hardy's life, I also acknowledge Hardy's dedication to the textual tradition of ballads. As Dennis Taylor notes, 
Hardy's balladry was consistent with his interest in other metrical forms, which were undergoing historical development or exploration in the later 19th century. Sorry, I'm just swigging, um, what is this? Lemon and ginger tea. The power of ballads derives from their near incantatory meter. A ballad singer continually relates stories. To tell might be considered the bard's verb. Yet this particular verb breaks down under pressure. Ballads have a peculiar relationship with revelation. Formally, they appear simple, yet their content asks to be deciphered, even as they may ultimately suggest there is no conclusion to be found. In this way, ballads anchor the memory with their assured expectations and also insist on further encoding of memories as the reader engages with what is being handed on. While the ballad maker tells, he or she neglects to tell all, asking the reader to provide part of the message and thus of the memory. Hardy is known as a regional poet, often cultivating local voices in verse. However, his ballads shift away from representing folk speech in dialect and more towards the telling of local stories. Tom Gunn claims that the single most important influence on Hardy is that of the ballads, and the majority of his poems derive either directly or indirectly from them. So characteristic is the ballad style of Hardy that, according to Gunn, his poems give the, ballad, sorry, give the reader ballad expectations and lead her or him to anticipate not only patterns, but even parts of the narrative because ballads have a set of expectancy patterns narratively as well as formally. Deceptively simple, ballads are usually enigmatic rather than revelatory. Gunn notes how central omission is to the form, that, quote, we get a pairing down to essentials, and the greater the pairing, the wider and richer the implications. Now, Tom Gunn here is building on the earlier scholarship of Norman Arkins, who traces Hardy's inheritance of Wordsworthian ballads, and in particular how the term after Wordsworth promised an emphasis on narrative. Arkins is largely concerned with how poems have previously been classified, but highlights, unlike other critics, the force of the ballad impulse in Hardy. As suggested above, Arkin sees a large proportion of Hardy's poems derived from a primal ballad impulse of telling a story. Having established via Robert Langbaum that the lyrical ballads saw a conjunction of the traditional objectivity of the new, sorry, of the authentic ballads and the narrative subjectivity of the new ballads, Arkins sees Hardy's development within ballads as further towards narrative and in the web of emotion in the speaker. Arkin's distinction, though, even for Wordsworthian ballads, relies on a category of authentic ballads, which seemingly exist outside of documented culture. Leaning towards incantation and ritual, ballads invite too easy a belief in the natural. To write within the ballad tradition, then, is to cultivate a sound so culturally ingrained that it seems to be extra-cultural, when in fact it is thoroughly contingent and fashioned after the economical use of human cognitive faculties. So Hardy's balladic gestures were generally well received by his public, and as Arkins notes, quote, contemporary readers seem to hear in Hardy's verse something we have not heard to the same extent, the presence of ancestral voices descended from more primitive bardic voices, spinning yarns, singing tales, weaving stories. But this kind of voice found in ballads, which speaks best to, sorry, the voice found in ballads speaks best to, or is best heard by, a culture which still feels its oral lineage. Like dialect, like sound itself, Ballads, too, were passing out of a culture which defined itself primarily in terms of the textual rather than the oral, and Hardy used his verses to keep the form not just remembered, but still transmitting memories. Okay, 
This is the last section, it's the shortest. We're nearly there, people. What we've seen in the ballads of Wordsworth and Hardy is their adherence to formal principles, which come from a tradition of oral poetry, one which had to rely heavily on mnemonic devices. As Alan Bold explains, an unlettered person had to rely on conventions and a contemptibly familiar structure in order to retain a large number of stories. The evolution of the form made memorization easier, made it possible for the mind to lock onto a definite conceptual shape. It was this shape that was fixed in the brain, and when it passed from mind to mind by the oral tradition, incidental variations were inevitable. So ballads are schematic story containers sturdy enough to retain their basic shape despite repeated usage by different people. Now, can we just say that the ballad only offers a contemptibly familiar structure when judged by the standards of literary works? This mnemonic property is purposeful and valuable within oral culture. But what interests me here is Bold's notion of a shape that was fixed in the brain, which could be passed from mind to mind. Ballad tradition has long been part of cultural memory, with its long rehearsed narratives and ability to bind an audience. But because of the form, there is also a crucial cognitive aspect to ballads. Psychologist David C. Rubin wrote a critical monograph examining the cognitive psychology of ballads, epics and counting out rhymes, three forms of poetry which all derive from oral culture. In understanding the mnemonics of oral traditions, Rubin writes at length on the importance of rhythm. He does not make the distinction from literary criticism between rhythm and metre, that the former is the variability of individual words, whereas the metre is the stable, underlying pattern of stresses. Therefore, he, he seems to use the term rhythm in place of metre. Rubin's theory of remembering for oral traditions marks metre out as the most significant constraint. And it's important to say here that, that constraint is not pejorative. Uh, although it kind of sounds like it is, he means simply a mnemonic device, something that actually helps you to remember. The poetic devices of rhyme, alliteration and assonance work locally within lines and between nearby lines. Meaning and imagery also appear to function mostly in a local serial fashion to limit choices and to increase the discriminability of items in memory. Of all the constraints discussed earlier in the book, Rhythm is the most effective globally because the specific rhythm being used in the line or stanza being sung is usually the same specific rhythm that is used in all lines or stanzas. The local organisation is the global organisation. Here, Rubin stresses the pervasiveness of the metrical constraint as a constant. Meter provides a framework upon which other constraints may be overlaid to secure memory further. As Rubin is specifically discussing oral traditions, he points out that, quote, the demand to recall something, sorry, that's not on a slide, I don't know why I did that, um, the demand to recall something rhythmically appropriate encourages something to be produced, even when cue item discriminability is low. In this way, rhythm functions to increase variation as well as stability. Now, just to slightly unpack that idea, um, when he says that, that, you know, that it encourages something to be produced even when cue item discriminability is low, um, what he means is that basically people will fill in the rhyme with a rhyming word. It might not be the right rhyming word, but you will come up with one because you will feel compelled to do so. And Rubin, with his uh, colleagues, have actually run uh, some quite amusing psychology experiments where they do things like um, ask people to recall the lines of, of Beatles songs. And yes, there are some amusing examples of where the undergraduates they were testing couldn't come up with the actual line, but very confidently came up with essentially an alternative line that still fit the rhyme pattern and the metrical pattern. So while psychology might uh, talk in terms of constraints and discriminability, Wordsworth and Hardy were discussing the same ideas, but using different terms. Wordsworth led the way in embracing rustic diction and a concern for the uses of metre 
And as I've said, Hardy was really influenced by, by Wordsworth's work. Much as the preface sought to explain Wordsworth's style and method, Hardy chose to quote from it in his own apology uh, to his collection Late Lyrics, published in 1922. Hardy again wishes to acknowledge or point out that he remembers that by the act of writing in verse, an author makes a formal engagement that he will gratify certain known habits of association, that he not only thus appraises the reader that certain ideas, certain classes of ideas and expressions will be found in his book, but that others will be carefully excluded. The publishing of poetry becomes an almost contractual agreement. Here, I will violate none of the regulations we laid out together. It is a design which brings together poem, poet and reader and suggests that cultural memory provides guidelines to be honoured. It could almost be about memory since laws of association um, framed 18th century theorising about memory. Verse then is recognisable as such and the mem memories the reader has of previous material enables her or him to read new material. In the original, the quotation continues, this exponent or symbol held forth by metrical language must in different eras of literature have excited very different expectations. This allows for meter as a culturally evolving phenomenon and posits it as a historical artifact, not just a sensory experience. Both Wordsworth and Hardy have the sense that poetry comes with certain culturally ingrained expectations, expectations so strong that they feel the need to explain their respective deviations from these habits, but also show a keen awareness of how to manipulate the reader's local level expectations of what is forthcoming in the next lines. Now, this is intriguing when one reconsiders the difference between metrical and free verse. In a 1923 letter to Amy Lowell, Hardy takes at a task about expectancy. He allows that free verse contains ideas striking, novel or beautiful, which could be transfused into poetry. But in considering why free verse seems to him not to be poetry, Hardy hazards, perhaps because there is no expectation raised of a response in sound or beat and the pleasure of its gratification, as in regular poetry. Hardy seems to be aware of the reader waiting to respond to the text. In another fragment, Hardy writes, the great charm of poetical form lies in its relation to something received or expected. Free verse offers no attraction of that nature, except perhaps that one sort of cadence leads you to expect another of the sort, which may or may not follow. It is demanded, as in measure or rhyme. Pleasure, attraction. It is as if Hardy sees expectation in poetry as a psychophysiological experience necessary for the reader's satisfaction. The reader needs to be led to expect as part of the reading experience, and this is what free verse is missing. For it is only when playing upon a reader's expectations that you can really surprise or jar them. So these are the first three stanzas of uh, Hardy's 1913 poem, The Voice. I'm just going to read the first stanza to give you the pattern. Woman much missed how you call to me, call to me, saying that now you are not as you were when you had changed from the one who was all to me, but as at first when our day was fair. In these first three stanzas to his dead wife, Hardy maintains the ABAB cross-rhymed quatrains of ballad form but he extends the line lengths to an approximation of 12-10-12-10 rather than 8-6-8-6. And it's only when you've habituated to the reader to that particular pattern that the final stanza really stuns. Thus I, faltering forward, leaves around me falling, wind oozing thin through the thorn from norward, and the woman calling. So the question of poetic form is also one about what you are trying to excite within the reader. 
And this debate was raging in the journals, letters and articles of the poetically minded in the early decades of the 20th century. Perhaps poetic form returns us then to the fundamental understanding of what on earth poetry is. In his polemic against free verse, the then poet laureate Robert Bridges notes, the main effectual difference between the rhythms of the old metrical verse and of fine prose is that in verse, you have a greater expectancy of the rhythm. And the poet's art was to vary the expected rhythm as much as he could without disagreeably balking the expectation. So I can think of no more fitting end to this lecture than to bring together all we've discussed by reading you my all time favorite ballad. And this is one that I'm technically not allowed to read to you because it was written by an American, um, but because um, I don't teach in Germany, so for us, uh, American literature and English literature aren't split in the same way. That's, I find it absolutely fascinating. But anyway, um, this is a much-loved poem. Uh, indeed, former American poet laureate Robert Pinsky calls it a ballad to the ballad power. Edwin Arlington Robinson here leans heavily on the traditional structure of the ballad and then extends it beyond its usual form. He tells a timeless tale in both stark, simple vocabulary and the occasional, unexpected polysyllable. Intriguingly, he ties the ballad form to another ancient genre, Greek tragedy and the function of the chorus. So here's Eros Tyrannos, or Love the Tyrant. I hope you enjoy it. She fears him and will always ask what fated her to choose him. She meets in his engaging mask all reasons to refuse him. But what she meets and what she fears are less than are the downward years, drawn slowly to the foamless weirs of age, were she to lose him. Between a blurred sagacity that once had power to sound him, and love that will not let him be the Judith that she found him, her pride assuages her almost, as if it were alone the cost. He sees that he will not be lost, and waits and looks around him. A sense of ocean and old trees envelops and allures him. Tradition, touching all he sees, beguiles and reassures him. And all her doubts of what he says are dimmed with what she knows of days till even prejudice delays and fades, and she secures him. The falling leaf inaugurates the reign of her confusion, the pounding wave reverberates the dirge of her illusion, and home, where passion lived and died, becomes a place where she can hide, while all the town and harbour side vibrate with her seclusion. We tell you, tapping on our brows the story as it should be, as if the story of a house were told, or ever could be. We'll have no kindly veil between her visions and those we have seen, as if we guessed what hers have been, or what they are, or would be. Meanwhile, we do no harm, for they that with a god have striven, not hearing much of what we say, Take what the God has given. Though like waves breaking it may be, or like a changed familiar tree, or like a stairway to the sea where down the blind are driven. Okay, that's all from me. Um, very strange to do this virtually and not to um, see you and kind of read the room. But anyway, um, if you enjoyed that, particularly if you enjoyed the kind of uh, combining of scientific knowledge and interest with literature, then um, I'm the co-host of Lit Sci Pod, the literature and science podcast. Um, and you can listen to all of our episodes are freely available online. We are trying to make more despite being in lockdown and uh, at a distance from indeed everybody. Um, but yes, so if you would like to, to explore those, you would be very welcome.
And finally, I shall leave up the slide with um, some references on just for a short while. But yes, take care, stay safe, um, stay away from everybody else. <laughs> and yes, remember that the joy of reading is very much still available to you. And thank God, um, that's certainly what's getting me through. All right, take care.